Welcome to the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Lace up those boots and sling on the pack for a romp through trails, short and long. With your host and renaissance man, Doc, it's time to embrace the suck. Welcome back to another week on the Trail Dirt Bags and Hiker Trash. I'm Doc, and this is the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Let's start off with a reminder. If you are enjoying the podcast, take just a minute to help us out. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're not enjoying the pod, well, just go ahead and keep that to yourself. All right, let's get to this week's incredible story. Today, I am talking to a through hiker from the Pacific Northwest who grabbed his dream by the horns and hiked the PCT after retiring from the military. Welcome to the John Freaking Muir Pod, Jay France. How's it going, Jay? It's going great, Doc, and uh, really appreciate what you're doing for our community and uh, appreciate you uh, allowing me the opportunity to come on and spend some time with you. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you. What what branch of the military did you serve in? So I served 31 and a half years in our United States Air Force. And what was your what was your your rank and your responsibility there at the end? Uh, at the end, I was a, a chief master sergeant, uh, which is uh, our E9, our top enlisted grade, and uh, retired as the command senior enlisted leader for United States Transportation Command. Mm -hmm. Top enlisted um, person, top, top enlisted rank, right? You, there's, a, there's a difference between officers and enlisted folks, correct? That is correct, yes. Yeah, is there is there some... Uh, uh playful back and forth between the the officers and the enlisted the enlisted folks oh absolutely but uh, you know the enlisted is the backbone um it, you know of all services and uh we we enjoy spending the time especially with our young officers and, and watching them grow up and uh more times than not run into people later on in their career and we get to talk about the fun times we had jabbing each other as as young people and uh which you know grows us into the people we are at the end of our careers, um, usually, you know, doing some bigger things. Right. Right. You know, I, I'm, yeah. in, I'm in education. So there, there's a similar, uh, dichotomy there between our, our certificated staff and our non-certificated mm -hmm. staff also called our, our classified staff. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we celebrate our classified staff as, as like you said, being the backbone or the, of the organization. Schools don't get mm -hmm. opened up. They don't get cleaned. They don't get, they don't, they don't uh, get supported if the classified staff aren't there. And so I, 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 I can appreciate the dynamic that, that uh, in, exists between the officers and the enlisted ranks. Right on. All right. Hey, Jay, now I, we know that you're a, a PCT through hiker. Did you mm -hmm. pick up a trail name along the way? I certainly did. Yeah. My, uh, my trail name is meat grinder. Meat grinder, like, a, like, a, like at a butcher shop or how, how does that work? Not in a murder way, not in a horror story way. Uh, it comes down to uh, my soft, supple nipples. Um, I had a, a nipple chafe problem. And uh, yeah, so day two on the Pacific Crest Trail, well, day one, uh, I started out wearing a uh, Columbia Silver Ridge shirt. And uh, uh, the inside of the chest pockets have mesh on the inside. And I uh, was experiencing a little chafing. Um, didn't think to tape them up like I used to do when I would run and just thought I would ride it out. Uh, well, the second day was really bad uh, to where it was actually bleeding through my shirt. And uh, I was walking into Lake Morena uh, with a firefighter who, you know, we're just hiking together, um, kind of busting each other's chops and, you know, talking about our careers. He was retired as well. And uh, yeah, we just took a break um, and I went into the bathroom there at the Lake Marina campground and uh, thought I was alone. And uh, yeah, so I, I took off my shirt and washed myself up and I was rubbing Neosporin on my left nipple. And the guy comes in, he's like, bro, what the, you know, what the heck is going on? And uh, you, you know, it was an awkward, you know, but kind of a funny situation. And uh, he let me, you know, have my privacy and walked out. He's like, hey man, you know, I was gonna call you nips, but I think we're gonna go with meat grinder. And uh, so I was like, hey, that's, you know, that's pretty cool. But, uh, then I noticed uh, last year, I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail in 2021. Um, there were a lot of young solo women hikers on the trip. 
And when I would meet somebody in a remote spot, they're like, Hey, what's your trail name? I'm like meat grinder. And they're like, Oh shit. You know, um, again, I was like, Hey, not in a murder way, not in a horror story kind of way, but you know, it's about my nipples. And so the, just the conversation didn't get any better. So I thought I could get a good idea and, and, uh, shorten it to grinder. Um, not knowing about the, the hookup app for men and, uh, had no idea. I'm, I'm 51 years old. I don't, um, uh, you know, You're I didn't know about that. You're a youngster. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I learned quickly as I'm hiking around three guys and, you know, no one was judgy on the trail and they're like, Hey bro, you know, what's your trail name? I was like, grinder. They're like, cool, man. You know what grinder is? I was like, yeah. So we're just talking, uh, you know, no big deal. About two days later, I'm talking about my wife and kids and they're looking at me all confused and they're like, bro, do you really know what grinder is? And I'm like, yeah, it's a hot Italian sandwich. It's delicious. And they're like, no, it's a hot Italian something, but it's not a hot Italian sandwich. So they broke it down for me. And, uh, you know, then I, I went back to meat grinder and, um, yeah, so there it is. I stuck with it. <laughs> all right. I was going to ask you if, if we were to shorten it, would you go by grinder or would you go by meat? Because you know, that's a, uh, I would, that's I would, a lot yeah. of food. So, <laughs> yeah, but I did get a compliment later on the trail. One of the guys uh, that I was hiking around was like, bro, you would totally kill on grinder. I was like, Hey, thanks, man. You know, I appreciate the compliment, but uh, yeah. <laughs> that's what was intended. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Now meat grinder, I have to tell you that, you know, we're here in season five. We're uh -huh. working on our way to 250 episodes. And awesome. I can honestly say that this is the first episode where the the phrase soft supple nipples has been used so yeah I want to congratulate you on kind of being groundbreaking in that area that's what winning looks like thank you yeah and you know what any the name is this is the name that just keeps on giving because as people uh, ask you what your trail name is and you have to explain it and, and there's always this phrase in there about well it's about my nipples i mean yeah that is just that's golden <laughs> that's gold yeah and then people ask to see them and, and uh, you know, the word kind of traveled up the oh. trail. They're like, Oh, you're meat grinder. Can I see your nipples? I was like, well, you know, um, they're pretty unremarkable now that they've healed, but if you got some pasties or something, I mean, I'll rock them. It's, it's cool. Right. You know, right. but nobody produced the pasties, but so all good. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't think that people would ask to see them. That's a, that's a different wrinkle. A lot of people did. <laughs> yeah. As if your, your unusual nipple, had something to do with the fact that they were bleeding when it was actually the shirt, right? Yeah, it was, it was the shirt, but uh, yeah, I swapped to a sun hoodie later on and no more, uh, no more nipple problems. But, nice. Yeah. Sun hoodies, great creation, right? I mean, it, it seems like Absolutely. A, a recent development just over the last two or three years. Uh, yeah. I was out there sporting the, the button up, you know, long sleeve mm -hmm. uh, gear for a while and, and looking kind of nerdy and discovered the sun hoodie and have never looked back. Yeah. 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 I wore the, uh, the Columbia shirt for a while. I mean, it healed. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I swapped out at, uh, Mammoth Lakes and, uh, yeah, not turning back, uh, wore a sun hoodie exclusively on the Colorado trail this year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's my go-to never turn it back. Well, you know, if, if you wore the Columbia shirt from, from Campo to, to Mammoth Lakes, I mean, maybe the people were right in asking to see your nipples. I mean, maybe, maybe there's like huge calluses built up after that. That uh, Yeah, pretty much. That's how it was. I cut the, uh, I cut the mesh out and, uh, you know, that seemed to ease it a little bit, but I yeah, I'll tell you, doc, you know, it's, it's, uh, you, 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 you cut a circle out in the, in the, in the front of the shirt. That you just, had them just so out. they would, Perfect. yeah, just so they would poke out. Oh man, I wish I would have thought of that. Oh, it's too late. <laughs> Nice. Hey, now you are not the only retired military that I've talked to on the podcast. I've talked to a couple of others, most notably Ginger Balls, Ben Vaughn. Yeah. Commander, yeah. Lieutenant Commander. He was on the other side. He was he was on the officer side. He was lieutenant. Yeah. Commander, I think in the Naval Reserve. Yeah. And um, I'm interested to hear how your story compares to his and just in terms of uh, and we'll get there. I don't want you to answer. Right yeah, now. yeah. We'll get there. But in terms of getting interested in hiking and discovering the the PCT and how that all went, so yeah, uh, it's going to be an interesting comparison in my in my mind as we go through this. Great. All right. Now, hey, uh, meat or grinder or meat grinder. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm going to play around with that throughout the episode, so don't be surprised. Yeah. Uh, meat grinder. Have you had a chance to listen to the podcast before? I have. So, uh, some of the, uh, the folks that were influencers and, and, uh, YouTube YouTubers that, uh, that I had watched, uh, in preparation for both the, uh, Pacific Crest Trail and Colorado Trail. So yeah, I watched, uh, I beat uh, feathers. 
uh, Chad, I think Lubinsky is his last name. Chad and uh, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And, uh, and uh, wow, what's the, the other guy's name? He's on the PCT right now. Um, you Smith. had him on twice. No, he's from Florida. Um, oh, Jupiter. Jupiter. Yeah, I watched, uh, watched those two as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I mentioned Carl Stanfield. Um, just a, a little, a quick little shout out because Carl Stanfield, also known as the professor, uh-huh. he actually set out this year to try and set the the record for most miles hiked in a calendar year. And he's fallen short and he feels kind of disappointed by that. But um, what he has done this year is he is hiking. He's hiked. He hiked the international AT. So he went mm-hmm. to Key West, Florida to the Canadian border. So basically mm-hmm. the Florida border there, if Key West is the Southern border, I, I would say it is. Yeah. And he did the CDT, uh, went from, I think it was northbound. I think he went, uh, New Mexico to Canada. Uh, so mm-hmm. the Alaskan border to Canada. And then he did a southbound hike of the PCT and he's actually in my neck of the woods. I found out uh, through social media, he's in my neck of the woods. Yeah. And I actually met him last night. I went to where he was hiking. He's happy to be passing through a, a campground that was accessible by car. I picked him up and we went to dinner. I took him to dinner, paid for his dinner. And uh, then also took him shopping to resupply at a, at a market that was open. Yeah. And took him back. And it was just, a, it, it was so cool. Uh, I, I enjoy talking to people, but it's even better meeting them in person and kind of interacting with them and, and seeing them up close and, and hearing how things are going. So that was a really cool moment for, for me. Yeah. He's incredible. I've been watching his journey. I've been watching you know, Quadzilla's journey on social media. Um, you know, both, both going about it in different ways, but, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's cool to see professor. I know he's gotta be, he's gotta be getting close to wherever his finish is, but man, you want to talk about impressive, but, um, you got to meet the man. So you know all about it. He's got about 430 miles left and we're recording this episode on November 29th. He's got a yeah. plane on December 18th. Mm-hmm. He is confident that he will make it down to the border and, and make that plane. So yeah. Awesome. And Quadzilla, I talked to Quadzilla. He's agreed to come back on once he has finished. And I think he, his finish is almost is is imminent. I mean, he's almost done. So. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed some of his uh, his videos are, um, you know, he's posting a little bit afterwards. So he's got to be getting close. Because um, I saw last time I, th- I saw, I think he's in, uh, I think he's in New Mexico because he's finishing up doing southbound on the, uh, on the CT. Ran into some tough weather up there yeah. in, uh, in Colorado. But uh, yeah, guy's a beast. Yeah. And so for those folks listening who aren't, maybe aren't familiar with uh, Professor and Quadzilla, they are both embarking upon and finishing up the calendar year Triple Crown. That's where you hike all three American long trails in one calendar year. And prior to this year, I think we were at 13 people that had done it. And, and mm-hmm. I, have, I have talked to, I think, uh, five or six of those people. And so uh, with with the addition of Quadzilla and Professor, uh, that'll be – that'll be uh, I think more than half or just about half of the people who have done the calendar triple crown, which I, which I think is pretty cool. I mean, those people are, incredible. It is. they've got yeah. just uh, an incredible mindset. I think it, in talking with, with the professor last night, you know, we talked about whether it was a tip, tougher physical feat or mental feat. And uh, he, he, he thinks it's, it's probably more mental. You just, yeah, you know, I would agree. You persist. You have to stay out there. He's been out there since January 1st. Yeah. That is just incredible. Um, even on the, uh, you know, doing one trail, um, uh, even a shorter trail, you know, for, for me as well, um, the mental, the mental piece got it, um, as far as the, you know, preparation, the physical piece, no worries again, but the mental, um, or missing my family, you know, that's, that's what the, uh, the challenge is, um, for me, but you know, it hits everyone different. Sometimes some days it's physical piece, some days it's the mental piece. Um, but I would say overall, probably the mental would be the the most difficult for especially something like that. Wow. Yeah, yeah Meek Grinder, I asked you if you'd listen to any of the episodes. I want to make sure that you're aware mm-hmm. of a segment that happens towards the end called the Pro Tip Inside of the Week. That's where I will turn yeah. and ask uh, you to share some trail wisdom with our listeners to make their next outdoor experience better. So I know you're aware of that. I am. All right. The Must Bring Gear Review. Another feature we've been doing this season, as you know, is the Must Bring Gear Review, sponsored by the Ultralight Backpacking Gear Company, Six Moon Designs. Are you familiar with Six Moon Designs? I am. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, carried their uh, their umbrella this year on the Colorado trip. 
You know, I get that yeah. from a lot of people. They, they've heard yeah. designs and the, the most prominent piece of equipment that they have purchased has been the umbrella. Yeah, I met them at uh, uh, PCT on uh, uh, the Trail Days piece up there in uh, uh, Cascade Locks and bought it then. Didn't want to carry it through Washington, so I sent it home, but uh, but used it this year on the uh, on the CT. Now, did you find a way to attach it to your to your pack or something, or did you carry it in your hand the whole time? I just carried it uh, because what I found, I tried the, the attachment um, last year in the desert uh, on the PCT, and I was constantly messing around with it, you know, trying to get the proper angle for the wind and everything. So um, I would just put up my uh, put my trekking poles uh, in my bag, or, you know, sometimes I only bring one if I'm bringing a tent. Um, so yeah, I just found it easier rather than messing with it and have it blow away just to hold it. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, anyway, back to the must bring gear review. Here's how <laughs> it works. If you're to let a stranger pack your bag with pretty much generic gear for a multi-day hike or a multi-month hike, what is the one specific piece of gear you would insist on being packed? And if you've got a particular brand for that specific piece of gear, even better. So Meat Grinder, what is your must-bring piece of gear out there? It is my inflatable pillow. Um, it's the uh, Sea to Summit Eros. Mm -hmm. um, size huge, whatever that is, to uh, to support my head. Uh, sleep is extremely important to me. Um, so, you know, having that, uh, that piece of comfort, uh, even though it's a few ounces, which, you know, I don't sweat. Um, adds to my quality of sleep, which adds to the experience. So I take that thing all the time. Absolutely. I think, I think uh, two of the most prevalent things that have come up have been footwear because you got to keep your feet happy. Your yeah. Feet happy, you know, you're not happy. The hike is miserable. And the other thing is sleep. When it comes to sleep, um, it's so important, especially when you're out there uh, just grinding it day after day, you know, 20 mile days, 25 mile days for, for, you know, multiple months. I mean, you yeah. got to be getting that rest. Uh, how do you sleep out on the trail? I mean, just in terms of relative you know, ease, good night of sleep, you know, I always find it, you know, the first few days out on the trail, it, it's always difficult. A lot of tossing and turning. Mm -hmm. I never get a really good night's sleep until, I, until you know, a, a little bit into the hike. And uh, I seem to, I don't know if it's, it's, I've reached a point of exhaustion where I it just, I, I, I get a better night's sleep or what, what's happening there. How about you? Yeah, it's, uh, it's very similar, you know, the first couple of days, cause you know, it's a new environment. I've be, I'm, I'm no longer accustomed to those sounds. Um, but I'll tell you what, as soon as it, uh, as soon as I start getting that sleep, I sleep better on the trail than anywhere. I, I sleep horribly, uh, when I take zeros, if I'm in town in a hostel in a hotel, um, I really don't get quality sleep. I sleep really good when, uh, when I'm out on the trail. Yeah. Whether it's, uh, whether it's cowboy camping in a tent, tarp, hammock, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I always sleep better out there. All right. How about at home? Are you a good sleeper at home? Uh, not so much. I, you know, since I retired and that 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 constant level of stress has uh, has come down um, significantly. Um, you know, I used to be that wake up at two o'clock in the morning. You know, thinking about you know what I forgot yesterday or what I need to be thinking about forward. Um, so I really didn't sleep that well. Um, but you know, after uh, after the PCT, that started to improve, and now. It's great. <laughs> nice. Have you heard of Norman Clyde? Uh, no, I have not. Norman Clyde. He was a he was a high school principal in Independence, California, which is just east yeah. of the Sierras, and mm -hmm. he got fired from his job, which is a good thing for Norman because he he then pursued his true love, which was exploring the Sierras. Yeah, he did a lot of search and rescues, um, he, a lot of F, uh, first ascents. Mm -hmm. There, you know, the Clyde Minaret, there are a lot of things named after Norman Clyde in the Sierras just because he was a trailblazer there. Yeah. But when he kind of retired from the life of uh, being a pioneer in the Sierras and he, he lived in a house, uh, I think, uh, east of the, of the Sierras, mm -hmm. he would he would sleep in his front yard. He couldn't he could not sleep in a bed. He, he you know, hiking and and living in the mountains those extended periods of times for for decades just kind of ruined the whole yeah of bed for him he had to, he slept outside under the stars yeah I, I mean i can't you know hit him for that you know it does take a little bit of a readjustment period even on a shorter trail like the ct when i came back this year yeah it took took a couple days to get back used to it but uh yeah a shorter trail like the ct how, how long is the ct uh four four hundred eighty six miles 
400. They added, yeah, you know, <laughs> they added, uh, they added a few miles this year because they had a reroute. So I'm not sure if they're going to update their, uh, their official length, but, uh, I think it's three or four miles, um, uh, section of trail that they completed this year, but, uh, I'm not sure if that'll impact anything, but yeah. Yeah. Now inflatable pillow, great piece of must bring, must bring gear. What would you say to the people out there who are listening, who are thinking, you know what? I want to go ultra light. I want to use multi-purpose type gear. I'm going to use a stuff sack and a jacket or a stuff sack and some clothes. That'll be my pillow. I don't need to yeah. bring extra two or three ounces. I would say give it a try before, you know, making that decision. Um, you know, I've tried the, the stuff sack piece, you know, um, haven't tried with DCF or any of the newer materials, but I know the old sill nylon, you know, I sweat a lot. I'm a hot sleeper, you know, waking up with that thing stuck to my face. It just wasn't, it wasn't comfortable at all. Um, and with this pillow, the shape of it, you know, you can push it into your shoulder and, you know, you can move around, uh, toss and turn. I'm typically a side sleeper. So that thing stays put. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's yeah, that ought to try Fill, fill up a stuff sack with some so some dirty smelly clothes and oh, yeah. use that in your bed at home for for a week and see how it goes. See how you yeah. Sleep. I tried it. I went. I went not not in my bed, but I I I, I would try. You know, I was of that mindset of oh, I can, yeah. I, I, I can find something to be a pillow. Yeah. What pillow is a game changer? It is the inflatable pillow. It is well worth the two or three ounces. You're you're not going to feel that. Yeah, and if they're truly ultra light, they're not going to have extra clothes to put in there anyway. So. You know, I'll just throw that out there too. <laughs> they got the pair of clothes they're wearing. That's it. Yeah. Maybe a pair of, maybe, a, maybe a pair of chonies. I don't know. An extra pair. Maybe, maybe. All right. It's the hiking pole. All right. Meat grinder time for the hiking pole. And that's P O L L two L's as in survey. Not, not what you're holding your hand out there. Mm -hmm. This is a seven question survey. That's going to help me assess your level of sanity. I'm going to give you a score between one and a hundred on the sanity scale with one being completely insane and 100 being completely sane. Now you have to know there's an automatic 25 point deduction. If you've done a long trail like the PCT. So right on. possible score at this point is, is 75. All right. And I might even take off another five or 10 points for being the, the, uh, the highest rank enlisted uh, uh, classification in, in the, in the air force. Hey, I'll do whatever I can to get some extra points. All right. Hey, if I were to ask your wife uh, or, or your family how they would score you on the sanity scale, where, where do you think you'd fall? Pretty pretty low. They've known me for a long time. Uh, you know, my wife served, so she got to you know see me at work, jumping out of airplanes, you know, shooting guns, doing all kinds of cool stuff. So uh, I'm really not scoring all that high on that to uh, to begin with. So our baseline's kind of low. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that's the great thing about family is that there there's no hiding. There's no hiding in a family. <laughs> no. No. They know the reality. You, you put on a good face for, for, you know, when you go to outside, outside yeah. gatherings or to, to the workplace, but you know, at home it, it's, they know the truth. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is seven questions. Um, and it's going to be based on, this is your first time on the podcast. So we're going to do mm -hmm. hiking questions. Hi questions. Great. So here we go. Question number one, we'll start easy. Trekking poles or no trekking poles? uh trekking poles oh there's there's a pause there hesitation yeah i uh I, I change my style as i go especially on a longer trail so um got rid of my trekking poles uh one of them on the pct kept one um just for my tent because it required one um uh but you know sometimes i'll, I'll take them sometimes i won't i try to challenge myself in different ways and uh Sometimes that means no trekking poles, but for the most part, the majority of the time, yes. Okay. How, how do your knees hold up without the trekking poles? Uh, it took me a while after I got back from the PCT. Um, you know, I had a, a, a lot of jobs that, that uh, kept me outside, wearing a lot of heavy equipment, jumping out of airplanes, those kind of things, you know, during our career. So I got to um, not any significant, you know, terrible knee issues, but I need to be a little bit more mindful of it. But they weren't all that happy with me um, for not wearing or for not using a trekking pole through Northern California and uh, in Oregon last year. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it took me a little bit to, uh, um, to recover, but now I'm all good. Do you enjoy jumping out of planes? Was that I did. A, yeah. Was that a fun experience. It was. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed it a lot. 
Nice. Now you didn't have those, did, or maybe you did. Did you have those fancy parachutes where you, you know, you pull on the handles and you're able to direct yourself or were these like kind of the traditional military parachutes? They were the traditional military parachutes, but the newer ones, even though they're round shoots, they do have toggles on them. So you can steer a bit. Um, not like the, uh, the square shoots where you're, you know, typically going to do a stand up landing or, you know, land, um, in a, you know, really small spot. Um, but they do allow you to maneuver them pretty well. Now, did you listen to the episode with Moab Joe or uh, z -Pack? I did not. They're both squirrel suit flyers. Oh, yeah. That's a different level of crazy right there. That is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Question number two. What's on your feet? Boots or trail runners? Now, military guy. I mean, I'm not sure how you're going to answer this. Uh, trail runners. You know, I had a... Uh, uh, you know, wore boots a lot. I uh, had the chance to go to army ranger school, you know, wearing boots all through that did a lot of miles there, actually a little bit on the, uh, on the AT, which is a different story, but, um, I did the wonderland trail in boots and that was a horrible experience. And, uh, after that went to, uh, went to trail runners and have not looked back. Do you have a specific brand you prefer of trail runners? I do. So, uh, typically I'll use, uh, ultras. Um, the Ultra Olympus. Um, I have not tried out their new Olympus 6, but the Olympus 4, um, I find really comfortable. Uh, the stack height is is the highest of all of their uh, all of their shoes. Um, so it helps a lot with, you know, reducing some of those lower extremity issues. Yeah, they're a great shoe. Got it. I was going to ask you what the difference was between the Olympus and the, the Lone Peaks, which just seem to be really popular out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't remember the the millimeter difference, um, but the Lone Peak, or I'm sorry, the the Olympus is significantly higher as far as that stack height, that uh, that amount of cushion um, than the uh, than the Lone Peak or the Timps. Right, right. So yeah, it, not a zero drop uh, shoe. It, it is still a zero drop. Um, oh, it is okay, but it, it is. It does. Yep. Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, when it comes to shelter out there, are you a tent guy, tarp, hammock, bivy, or hey, let's just go cowboy camping? What's your preference? Uh, my preference is cowboy camping, um, but um, I have done you know a couple trails with the hammock, um, but for the most part, the majority of the time, um, I'm using a tent just because that that uh, uh, bug protection, the additional wind protection. If it's cold, it's going to keep a little bit of that heat inside just a little bit. Um, better than some of those other options. Right. Now you mentioned bringing a pole, a single pole to assist mm -hmm. with it. What, what kind of tent did you use? Uh, I, I use a Z-Pax Altiplex on the PCT and uh, and the CT, but um, have a few tarps, you know, one I'll use for hammocking and then, you know, another really light uh, Z-Pax, I think is a seven by nine tarp. Mm -hmm. um, if I really want to get minimalistic, um, or, I mean, like I said, my preference would be to cowboy camp, but uh, I don't do bugs. Um, so, you know, that kind of took some of that out, especially in the Sierra last year. Yeah. Did you watch um, the documentary Highline? About the I have not. Highline? Uh, it's a great, no. great, great documentary. Guys are way out there. Really interesting yeah. uh, times out there. And it was, I think it's five guys. I talked, one of them was uh, Benny Braden. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he plug it in. That was his, his trail name. It was because of a shirt he was wearing. I think he was an electrician and he, he wore yeah. a shirt that had a, a plug on it. So <laughs> plug it in, which is just fan, a fantastic name. Yeah. Uh, one of the other guys in that group, uh, which I had no idea, was actually the creator of Z Packs. So, oh, right on. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. All right. Hey, question number four when it comes to uh, sleeping, are you a sleeping bag guy or a quilt? Quilt. Quilt. Mm -hmm. and what what, uh, what is your current quilt what's it rated to and who makes it so i have a enlightened equipment enigma that it's it's rated to 20 degrees um and then i also have a ugq bandit that's uh rated to 40 um and i i swap those out um uh you know if i if i need to you know i found it really hot last year um swapped out i uh, had my wife send me the bandit uh, up in northern california so carried that all the way through Northern California and Oregon and then sent back the, uh, the enlightened equipment enigma for Washington. 
yeah, I'm, I'm typically a really hot sleeper. So, uh, I've found those, you know, I've, I've brought down the, the 20 degree bag, um, down to 10 degrees and I've, I've, I found it pretty comfortable. Yeah. A 40 degree quilt. Isn't, shouldn't you just wear a, a puffy basically? Yeah, but I like to, uh, I also have a, uh, I will use a sleeping bag liner, a sea to summit sleeping bag liner to prevent a little bit of that draft and, and keep my quilts clean. Um, so I, I like to, um, cause you know, I sent my puffy home, um, last year. So I like to have just a little bit, usually I'll let it, uh, have it off to the side, just pull it over a cold spot or something like that. Um, especially if I'm, if I'm at higher elevations. Yeah, that's a great pro tip right there. Sleeping bag liner with a quilt. Uh, yeah, you can't use that now when we get to that section, but, uh, you know, it's <laughs> right on. You can drop those pro tips along the way. That's, that's good. Yeah. All right. Hey, question number five, be careful here. Big, big possible point deduction here. When it comes to food, stove, cold soak, or stoveless? Stove. Okay. Yeah. No hesitation. Stove. No hesitation. Got to have the hot food at the end of the day. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, typically I will cook before I get to camp. I'll pull over to the side, kind of reflect on the day, do some journaling or whatever while my food's getting ready. That way, when I get into camp, I can just move it. But uh, but for me, uh, especially after that, uh, that Army Ranger School experience, um, not being able to heat up that food ever since then, <laughs> I got to have some, uh, some hot chow. Um, and plus for me, it just kind of, uh, kind of boosts my morale a little bit. Um, you know, I thought about cold soaking. I have gone stoveless just with, you know, bars and jerky and, and things like that on shorter things. Um, but for the extended trips, uh, yeah, I got to have some hot chow and in the morning have some hot coffee that gets me going. You know, I love that concept. You know, most people think that they hike until they're done, they set mm -hmm. up camp, and then they eat. And what you've just described is a different approach where mm -hmm. you pull off to the side. You're not you're setting not setting up camp. You are you're no. preparing your meal, you're mm -hmm. eating, you're thinking, and yeah. then you're packing up and you're you got you get another couple couple hours in, right? I mean Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because I I uh, I tend to rush, I tend to over plan. Um you know, just based on, you know, a career of, of doing that. And I've found that um, I'm more mindful. I'm more reflective when I stop and, and take that minute and that reconstitution of that dehydrated meal um, helps me do that. Um, because when I get in the camp, I'm just trying to set up and I'm just trying to get sleep and get that rest and get up and go again. Got it. And I'm, we're going to come back to that a little bit later about uh, your experience in the military very mm -hmm. regimented lifestyle. I mean, everything is very orderly and planned out and you know, you can plan, <laughs> you can plan for a through hike, but planning only goes so far, right? Because mm -hmm. the, so I, I want to hear about that a little bit later. So we'll, yeah. we'll come back to that. All right. Question number six, is life better above or below the tree line? Above, above. That's why I'll never do the AT. Um, yeah. Above the tree line. I'm a West coast guy. I grew up in, you know, San Juan islands um, mountains are my, are my thing and uh, love the Sierra, loved Washington, um, getting above those trees and, and seeing out, uh, as far as the eye can see. Um, that's one of the things I love about the Colorado trail too. Um, love it above the tree line. Totally agree. No point deduction there. That, that is the only <laughs> correct answer and you did it without hesitation. So that is, that's spot on. That's right on. All right. Hey, question number seven, last question. What's more important, pack weight or luxury items? Are you the guy that was uh, cutting your toothbrush in half or drilling holes through your toothbrush or not even bringing a toothbrush, just using your finger out there or a stick? No, I'm not that level of psycho. Um, you know, I'm, I'm about luxury items. You know, if I bring it, I got to carry it. I got to suck it up. I got to deal with it. Um, I'm not one for comparisons. That actually um, really drives me nuts. Um, if I want to bring it, I'll bring it. Um, yeah, of course I'm going to go as light as I can. I'm going to make good decisions. I'm going to maintain, um, you know, safety and things like that. Um, but if I want to bring something, I'm bringing it and yeah, not answering to anybody. You know what I mean? <laughs> now this, this, I have another question. It is, is yeah. it's not part of the hiking bowl. It's just a corollary question. It's not uh -huh. going to impact your score. Did yeah. you know your back weight, your base weight on the PCT? Yeah, I started out, it was uh 14 and a half. Um, and then when I swapped out packs, I swapped out a lot of stuff when I got to Northern California, um, got down to about 10 and a half. And for the Colorado 
trail. I brought my tin car fly rod and a few other luxury items. Um, so I was about 11 pounds up there too. So, yeah. Well done. Well done. All right. Hey, I got to do some math now, which is, uh, it gets complicated here. I got, I got to take your answers and put them through the, the John freaking mirror algorithm. Right on. Uh, I say I carry the three. We're going to divide by root two, uh, multiply by pi. And uh, we'll, we'll adjust for the altitude at the top of Whitney. And I come up with a solid score of 52. You're just north of right the waypoint. So not, not too insane. You gave some pretty good answers. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. It's good to have some uh, some confirmation that I'm not too crazy there. It, it just tells me that you put on a good face here for me, but you, your family knows <laughs> it. So. They do, yeah. All right. Hey, before we get too far down the trail, let's back up a little bit. I'd love mm -hmm. to hear about uh, your background, where you grew up, uh, sports and hobbies you played, and how you, how did you get involved in the through hiking cult? And I, you know, you, you piqued my interest because you said you grew up in the San Juan Islands. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up on uh, Whidbey Island, Washington. It's uh, it's up, you know, of course, in the San Juans, about an hour and a half north of Seattle. Yes, um, I was I was there, not on Whidbey, but on Bainbridge. Uh, oh, okay, right on. Uh, Took a little trip up to Seattle, and and then we drove up to Vancouver, and we yeah. spent a little time on on Bainbridge, which was really cool. I mean, what a what yeah, a great little community. It was it was an awesome place to grow up. You know, grew up as a as an outdoor kid. Um, you know, I had an aunt and uncle that uh, that traveled a lot to national parks in the summertime. Um, I was an only child, um, you know, single mom situation, so uh, I would go spend time with uh, uh, with my aunt and uncle and and my one cousin. Um, you know, we went all over the place. My uncle actually introduced me to, uh, to backpacking, to hiking, to fishing, you know, all those things as a, as a young guy. And, um, yeah, I just took off from there. You know, the woods were, were my place, you know, where I would go, uh, when I got old enough, got into mountain biking, skiing, uh, you know, a lot of fishing, things like that. Um, and I, you know, <clears throat> the, the through hiking answer there too, um, that was my grandmother, um, you know, this is not just the through hiking, but the PCT as well. So I was born in April of, uh, of 71 and, uh, there's a June 1971 issue of national geographic that features the Pacific crest trail. And, uh, I was about eight or nine and she had that, uh, you know, I was a few years old at that time, had that thing sitting out there. I was looking at that and I was just blown away as a little guy on the, on the scale of this, and, you know, looking through and, you know, my grandmother and I look through it, there's pictures of goat rocks and Glacier Peak and Crater Lake and fire. And, you know, you could see the the look of hard work, but contentment, you know, on the faces of, of the people in there. And she's like, hey, you ought to do this someday. You could you could knock this thing out. I'm just like, whoa, that's crazy. So kind of put the PCT piece out of my mind, but <clears throat> continued uh, continued the hiking journey. Uh, actually, uh, in ninth grade, um, the school I went to had a hiking and backpacking class. Um, so it just, you know, was always in my world. Even when I uh, transitioned into uh, and joined the military, um, went all over the world and got to do some hiking at some just incredible places. And yeah, that's uh, that's where it started. Wow, Meat Grinder! I have to congratulate congratulate you again because not only are you the first person in five seasons to mention the words "soft, supple nipples," but you're also the first person to be inspired by his grandmother to yeah become a food hiker. That's that's impressive. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. She was a badass. She wasn't uh, she wasn't much of a hiker, but um, yeah, she uh, she you know put that uh, that positive vibe, that positive thought in uh, in my head. And um, didn't think about the PCT for a number of years, but. You know, fast forward and later it came up again and got to bang it out. Okay. Now, Ginger Balls, uh, who was, mm -hmm. as I said, also in the military, he he uh, he learned about the AT and thought about it for about 10 years while he was in the military. And then he mm -hmm. retired and said he was going to do it. He showed up uh, yeah. down at the at Springer Mountain with like a 60-pound pack. Yeah. In the military, he had he had three of everything just in case the first two. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm with him. So, yeah. So, I mean, your pack was substantially lighter at that point. I mean, you had gone through the yeah. your first, your first hike was the Wonderland trail. Yeah. You that was a shit show. Trail with, oh, really? Okay. Oh my goodness. That was about, uh, uh, that was in 2003. So that was a few years after graduating ranger school. And, you know, in my mind then heavy was hardcore and heavy was badass. And, you know, let me just 
got this through. So I had an Osprey Crescent 110, 110 liter pack. And of course, 110 liters, I have to fill every bit of it. Um, I had, and this is just ridiculous. I had a pair of boots, a pair of running shoes, because trail runners really hadn't come out yet. A pair of Tevas, like six pairs of socks, three of the eight ounce fuel canisters. It, it was ridiculous, but I had a tarp, which is just, okay. Um, I don't know what that uh, train of thought was there, but yeah, I'm going to go light because I'm going to bring a tarp. Um, but it was, um, I finished. I enjoyed the hike, but I did not enjoy hiking the hike. Um, it was rough. And after that, I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. And that's when, uh, Ray Jardine, um, you know, his hiking light stuff was, was kind of catching on and, you know, fabric technology and equipment was just starting to come on board. That go light company was, was, you know, kind of leading the way in that. Um, so yeah, I got rid of all that stuff and slowly, um, you know, rebuilt my, my backpacking kit. And, uh, it's been, it's been an evolution. Every single hike, I learned something. Every single hike, I'm tweaking something and trying something new. So uh, I don't ever think, you know, there's a, such thing as perfection, at least for me. Yeah. Nice. Now, yeah. Uh, word to the wise, if you if you have a 110 liter pack and you feel the need to fill that 110 liter pack, <laughs> that means that that whole hike is going to be type two fun. I mean, you are not going to enjoy the whole thing. what's happening, but you will tell, you will tell. Oh my God. My, my friend, yeah. You will tell all it was ridiculous. Guys. Uh, and people were just like, what in the hell is this guy doing? There were actually, uh, I went to one of the camps um, because that's a managed backcountry. When you get your permit, you have to pick the camps that uh, that you have to stay in on, on that particular trail. And I went to, I think it was White River Campground. And there were some um, some motorcycle campers, uh, guys in there that had the the off-road bikes with uh, the panniers and all that, all that stuff. And they were in the camp next to me. And they're kind of looking over at me as I was, um, you know, getting my resupply and kind of, you know, looking at things and they're like, dude, what are you doing? And uh, I was like, I, I, I'm just cutting this out, man. And uh, I only had a few days left. So, you know, they took some of the excess food and a couple of fuel canisters and, um, you know, they, they helped me out a little bit, but uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely a learning experience and, but an important part of the evolution, you know? Yeah. Now, a lot of folks out there have like a, you know, 40, maybe 42 liter or 55 mm -hmm is on the on the bigger mm -hmm. side just yeah. to put this in perspective <laughs> 110 liter that's, that's two times the size of a 55 <laughs> liter pack i mean you you had all kinds of room to put stuff in there oh yeah it was it was just absolutely ridiculous yeah yeah i had a a 35 liter pack for um northern or yeah northern california and oregon and you know I was, the whole time i'm out there thinking i was like man this thing you know not quite you know about two and a half times i guess uh, or yeah, close to th yeah, close to three times um, the size that that Osprey Crescent. That thing was ridiculous. Yeah. I think the pack itself had to weigh like twelve pounds. <laughs> you probably could have put a couple of kids and a goat in there. In I probably, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, hey, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna we're gonna get into the the nitty gritty of your PCT hike and your CT hike. Uh, so stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. And welcome back. We were talking to Jay France, also known as Meat Grinder or Meat or Grinder or, or maybe maybe Nips. I don't know. Nips. Nips. <laughs> uh, but before we leave the Wonderland Trail, uh, just want to want to check in real real quick. Any any other than hiking it with a 110 pound pack and all kinds of uh, redundant gear. Any other stories you might want to share from that trail? Yeah. So I, I ran into a. Uh... A person um, who was a little bit off and uh, um, turned out to be, you know, doing bad things out there. And I came up, I was on the east side of the trail. I can't remember exactly what mile it was, but I'm going up the switchback and I hear this kind of rhythmic humming. And uh, I walk up and I, I see this guy standing there. He's wearing like all cotton things. And he had like a, uh, what it looked to be like a, an old military like laundry bag just slung over um, over his back and he's about a foot away from a tree and he's just kind of rocking back and forth and, um, you know, making these kind of weird noises. I'm like, okay, you know, this guy's in the zone here and whatever I said, hello, as, as I do with everybody I pass and, you know, he had no change in behavior. He just kept going. Uh, I kind of go over and, and, you know, descend down into a lake where there were two guys fishing and, you know, said hello to them and start to get around this lake. And I hear someone yell help really loud. So 
I stop, didn't, didn't hear anything else. So I walk back to, to these guys, didn't see anybody. So I'm figuring, okay, you know, they just, uh, uh, I don't know if, if I didn't hear them properly or, or whatever. So I just keep hiking, not thinking about it. And about two days later, I go up to, uh, oh man, I think it was, I think it was sunrise. I can't exactly remember where I picked up the resupply, but basically there were rangers up there. And as soon as I walk up to get my resupply, they're like, Hey, have you seen this guy? You know, green pants, kind of a maroon shirt. I was like, yeah, he's carrying a laundry bag. He's like, yeah, man, when's the last time you saw him? I said two days ago. Well, apparently what this guy was doing uh, was living off other people's stuff because um, up at Rainier, you have bear poles that you have to hang your stuff on. And this guy was going around and stealing people's food bags and uh, you know, don't, don't mess with a man's chow. I mean, seriously. And uh, so um, they set up on this guy. And then the next ranger I talked to, I was like, Hey, did you guys, you know, roll up that a dude uh, that was, you know, stealing people's food bags. So apparently they caught the guy, but fortunately he didn't get mine. But uh, yeah, I had never had like a weird experience like that with someone, uh, someone on the trail, but yeah, that was just kind of a one-off, but uh, yeah, that, that was definitely a memorable moment for the wonderland. Yeah, that's kind of an anomaly out there because the hiking, the through hiking community is is usually a yeah pretty positive one, supportive one. Yeah, you know, nobody would would dream of of stealing stuff. But number one, it would yeah. add pack weight. Now, you know, maybe you got a hundred and ten pound, hundred and ten <laughs> liter pack, hundred and ten liter, yeah, that you wouldn't mind adding to. Yeah, but, but most <laughs> people, I'm not I'm not picking up anything additional. Are you kidding me? No, no, but yes, yeah, so that was it for the Wonderland. Yeah. And I also, I want to see how that story went, because if you were going to tell me that uh, you ran into somebody out there who just didn't look like, look like they knew what they were doing, I was going to say, you know, that's kind of like the the, the pot calling, calling the kettle black. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was not educating anyone out on that trail other than, you know, I was giving them plenty of humor and, you know, there were a few people that wanted to take pictures with me and stuff. I was like, oh, these people are nice. Now, I'm asked, they're taking a picture of you in that huge pack. <laughs> You won't yeah. believe the guy we ran into. Let me show you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you learned. I mean, that was a learning experience I did. on the Wonderland. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's another, I'm going to steal that pro tip. Uh, anytime you go out, you're going to learn something. Oh, yeah. It's going to refine how you approach your next hike. And so exactly. your next hike was the PCT. What did you do in preparation for, for the PCT? You, you You obviously understood this is a, yeah significantly longer hike than the wonderland trail this is 2650 miles border to border what did you do to get ready for that in terms of not only physical mm -hmm. but also you know preparation just to understand what you'd be running into out there yeah so uh, i watched um when i actually decided it was probably there's a documentary called wizards of the pct um that uh, uh the first that i know of people, uh, a group of hikers that uh, basically documented their journey, similar to what we do on YouTube now. Um, that came out, uh, I believe, 2011. I was watching that. Uh, you know, my wife's like, hey, you ought to do that someday. Um, you know, she she knew I'd been talking about that. I told her the story about my grandmother and everything. And I was still about, you know, 10 years out from retiring at, uh, at that point. And, um, but I watched it to learn. And I, I did a lot of I've done, you know, a lot of, a lot of hiking in the places that I've lived both in country and overseas, um, you know, again, constantly growing, constantly refining. So I knew, um, you know, what I was getting into, but I had never done anything that long. Um, so my preparation was uh, pretty much getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, I live in the St. Louis area and it's flat out here, but I, I didn't use that as an excuse not to train. So um, would go out and, and put in those miles. Um, do some, um, you know, some smaller hikes, um, going outside, you know, it gets pretty cold here in the winter, um, going outside and dialing in my gear, setting my stuff up outside, even though it was in my backyard when it's cold and my hands are, are tingling or numb or, or, you know, just those things that I knew I would probably experience out there. I tried to replicate those as much as I could, uh, before going. Uh, then on top of that, you know, just a lot of walking, a lot of walking with the pack on, um, just spending time with that additional weight um, as I had done, you know, uh, training for certain schools and courses in the military. Um, I kind of knew what I needed to do. I knew my body very well based on some of the experiences I've had um, in my career and hiking. So, yeah. 
So going to the market with the with the pack on, mowing the lawn with the pack on. Yeah, yeah. Walking around, um, just odd places. You know what what appeared to be odd, or just hey, if it's pouring rain outside. Well, guess what? I'm just going to go out there and walk. If it's windy and it just sucks outside, I'm going to go out there. If it's hot, I'm going to go out there. Um, just to uh, just to uh, put myself in some of those uncomfortable situations. Now, you're not the first person, Meek Grinder, to 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 emphasize the importance of being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And so for, for people listening in who who may not have any ability to relate to that and are thinking to themselves, why would I want to do something that is so uncomfortable? What where's the joy in that? Why why should I aspire to be comfortable being uncomfortable? What what, what do you have to say in response to that? Yeah, I would say, you know, those uncomfortable situations, your feeling of reward after experiencing that and after overcoming that, even if it's, you know, a short walk outside, you're going to come in, you're going to feel pretty good about it and say, hey, you know, I, I did that. Or you're going to go on a long hike and, and you're going to have uh, good times. You're going to have tough times. You're, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be happy. You're going to, be, you know, experience sadness. You're going to experience joy. Um, and I, I cannot think of a time on any hike where I haven't had an amazing experience that follows one of those hard days. Some of my best experiences hiking have been after a real embracing of the suck experience. Um, and I, like I said, I can't think of anything that hasn't. Um, so yeah, I look at it. Uh, I look at it that way. Yeah. There is something to be said that at the end of a long day of hiking, you turn around and you look back at the horizon and you, you, yeah. start, you know, I came from beyond that. Yeah, I, started, yeah. I started the day way back there and, and I, granted I have, I have not done a long trail like the PCT, but I imagine that that is, e- that is even amplified even more Yeah, uh, standing at the Canadian border and looking back and saying, I started in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. But I will also offer too, you know, I, you know, not everybody, um, you know, whether choice or situation, you know, uh, completes those. So another important thing that, um, that I like to, you know, discuss with people is, you know, be proud of whatever accomplishment that you made. Um, you know, I, I find it, it happens quite often when somebody says, Oh, I didn't finish the PCT. I didn't finish the AT. I didn't finish the CT. I didn't finish this or that. Well, what you did was you hiked a thousand miles or what you did was you hiked the Sierra or you hiked one of the three States in, in the PCT, for example, you know, focusing on the things that you did rather than, you know, perceiving it as you failing or not doing something. Hey, if you got everything out of that experience and it only took you 500 miles to do that, it's your time to peel off. Hey, be proud of, uh, be proud of your accomplishment, you know? Yeah. It kind of goes back to when I was talking about uh, the professor, right? I mean, he, he's disappointed that he didn't set the record for most miles <laughs> hiked in a year, but by God, that man hiked, uh, the calendar year triple crown border to border yeah. three times. I mean, how <laughs> is that? That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, you're right. I mean, if you look at the percentage of people on the planet that have hiked, have done a hundred mile hike, have done a 500 mm-hmm. mile hike, a thousand mile hike. I mean, you are in some rare air. If you've mm-hmm. done, even if you didn't, even if you didn't complete what you set out to complete. Uh, yeah. You're exactly right. I mean, they focus on the positive. Heck yeah. Yeah. All right. Hey, how long did it take you to do the PCT? How long were you out there? Uh, so I was uh, out for 144 days, but 120 days hiking. Um, so I, I took some zeros. Um, I enjoyed my time. Had to come off the trail to deal with, you know, some some life business. Um, I had a friend who I met in uh, in fourth grade who came out and hiked with me for a while. And I had to wait a few days um, for, for his schedule to open up. Um, his son was actually... Uh, about three weeks ahead of me. And uh, so he went and spent some time with him uh, between Walker Pass and Kennedy Meadows South. And then he came back and hiked with me in Oregon. So waited a few days and uh, didn't want to pass up that opportunity. So, um, and I was in absolutely no rush. So I retired uh, on the 1st of April, turned 50 the following week and then started the trail the following week. And I had no backstop. So I had all the time in the world. Um, So, you know, I enjoyed my time on the trail and I enjoyed my time in those awesome communities that, uh, that support the trail also. Yeah. So that that's less than what, five months. <clears throat> yeah. Nice. What was your big mileage day? Uh, I did a few 36s. 
um, I, I didn't, uh, um, you know, I didn't partake in the, in the Oregon challenge or the 24 hour challenge or, or anything like that. I, I got up when I wanted to hiked as far as I wanted to and, you know, stopped when I wanted to, you know, now the professor, he hiked 27 miles yesterday and he didn't eat uh-huh. anything for lunch. Cause he knew he was going to be having dinner with me. Then yeah. That man packed away some chow at dinner last night. <laughs> I'll bet he did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now you were gone for just under five months. How supportive was your wife for for this decision? I mean, to be away from somebody for five months—that's yeah, very too. That's 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 huge. She was awesome. So and and so were my sons. Um, you know, she knew that this was a childhood dream of mine, and she actually um, um, she got me pretty good. So I know that's because you know I've uh, I've deployed ten times. She's deployed twice. Um, you know, a lot of, she was, like I said, in the military as well. So we've spent a lot of time apart, um, uh, not just on deployments, but training and, and you know, those other things that, uh, that we need to do. So we were accustomed to it. And our, our sons were accustomed to, you know, one of us being gone and, and our philosophy on things is, you know, we're focusing on the time we have together rather than, you know, dwelling or, or being asked heard about, you know, the time that, uh, that me or mom are away. But, uh, I, I was, um, because, you know, she is, her and I have been together 22 years, been married 20 of that. And, you know, she's been by my side um, through thick and thin the whole time, as have my sons. And um, I felt a little bit guilty about, you know, wanting to do this thing. Um, so what I was going to do was uh, a compromise and I was going to hike five, the 500 miles of Washington to finish where I started in my home state. And she just kind of, what are you talking about, dude? She's like, man, up. I mean do the whole thing. I was like, all right. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what I wanted to hear. But, um, so she was great there. And then, then the support, um, I did, a. um, uh, I look at, uh, my, my resupply strategy. I, I do a lot of resupply boxes. Um, for me, um, that works the best because it saves time. It saves, frust- saves me frustration. I get that time back. If I go into a town, if I just have to go to a post office, yes, I am, at the mercy of post office hours or business hours, but I don't have to spend six times and I don't have to get pissed off when a group of, you know, a tramley's ahead of me and they're like locusts and they just like decimate everything. And I have, you know, a peanut butter packet and a jar of pickles, you know, the, to last me, um, you know, a hundred miles. I don't do that. Um, so, you know, she sent, uh, sent my resupply boxes from home. Um, and then I kind of, um, as I got to, Northern California, I purchased and sent forward my resupplies for Oregon. And then when I got to Cascade Locks, Portland area, I sent my stuff up from Washington. But she was my reach back when I had, um, you know, sleeping mat issues or, or things that I wanted to swap out. She was all over it, as were my kiddos. Now, you, you come from a military background. I can hear mm-hmm. the organization. I can hear your your plan. <laughs> <laughs> Life yeah. strategy, you've got it all mapped out you yeah. obviously you mentioned before you, you checked in with a lot of influencers out there mm-hmm. and watched their videos and followed their feeds and kind of got a, a handle on what you thought that the pct was going to be like did the pct match up to your expectations you pack up you go down to campo is it as you expected did it all did it all go to plan uh, it did, but then I, I tried to back away from that a little bit because I, you know, one of the experiences I wanted to get out of that was to slow down, um, to be present for myself after serving others for so many years and the focus as a leader of being everything for everybody facing out, you know, I kind of lost sight of, uh, you know, I could talk a good game on self-care. I could talk a good game on mental health and taking care of yourself and, reflecting and, you know, giving yourself time, but I really sucked at it. So, um, when I got out there, I realized soon that I was like, you know what, I've, I've done it again. And here I have, I've overplanned. Um, so I, I, I laid off of that, um, uh, even though I stuck with my resupply piece, um, because I look at that as again, time back, um, that I got. So I did, I did stick with that. Um, but then I really tried to, uh, to, to stop. Um, you know, scheduling, um, stop worrying about miles, stop worrying about, I got to get to this town, you know, by this day. And I just did as much freestyle as I could. 
but uh, I did apply some pressure to myself because uh, my family came and met me at, uh, at Tahoe um, over the Independence Day weekend. And for us to be able to do that, we had to make the Airbnb reservations before I left. So uh, the whole time in my mind, I was like, hey, I got to make these miles. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to get up there um, because the plan was for them to you know, come down from Reno pick me up wherever I was on the trail and then bring me back. Well, added an additional uh, little bit on there because I wanted to surprise them. So I did as many miles as I could. I got up to Donner Pass, came off, actually met them at the airport where, you know, to kind of surprise them. And uh, for me to be able to do that, uh, I had to stick to a pretty aggressive schedule two past days through the Sierra um, you know, just doing some things that, you know, when I reflect back, I'm glad we had the opportunity to, uh, get together. It was hard leaving them a second time that really sucked. And, you know, I had a pretty tough go in Northern California. Um, I have no regrets about the PCT, but if I were to do it again, I would just freestyle as much as I could, like, um, you know, just let off and, and take my time and, um, maybe, maybe do a little bit more shopping for resupply maybe not but uh definitely slow down yeah wow that that kind of blows my mind that uh you start in mexico start in campo and you you've you've already made the reservations for the fourth you've got to be in tahoe on july 4th mm-hmm. so no pressure there i mean you've got no you've, you've got a schedule to meet but <laughs> yeah yeah but i mean it was it was worth it to see them and you know spend five days off the trail and and, uh, you know, enjoy my time with them, recover because, um, yeah, I was pretty wore out when I got up there. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you talked about, you know, being comfortable, being uncomfortable Yeah, and taking that five day break with your family. I mean, you had to get right. You had to get comfortable right there being, being with them. Oh yeah. The, the, the familiar folks and just the, the comfort of being around them and then going back out again. I mean, I, I imagine that, that, like you said, Cal- Northern California was rough after that. Oh yeah. You know, you, you come out of, uh, you come out of the Sierra, which is just beautiful. And, and, um, Northern California was the place that I enjoyed the least. And as soon as, I mean, like I said, it was tough. They, they came up, they brought me back to Donner and, and, you know, went down the trail with me a little bit and, and, you know, we, uh, we said our goodbyes and, and then it was the next day, you know, the fires started. Um, Northern California is where a lot of the, strong mentally and physically hikers, you know, a lot of people make the decision to leave the trail at that point. And, uh, and it got in my head. And then, um, you know, the, the loneliness of, you know, missing my family, which I said was the hardest part. Um, the heat, you know, there was record heat, the fires, all of those things, just, um, I was not in the, in the greatest of, of mental state, um, when, uh, when I was in Northern California. So that was, you know, there were days where I was, I was just putting miles behind me to, to get out of the state and California is just so long. So all of these things, you know, kind of built up and, uh, and, and gave me a run for my money. Um, again, on that mental aspect, um, Northern California was tough for me. Yeah. What, what did you learn about yourself, me grinder from this experience? Yeah. So there, <clears throat> you know, I have, um, uh, a lot of deployment experiences and some of those, um, you know, pretty, pretty tough ones um, that I had to um, get some pretty, pretty deep, extensive mental health care and help from. And, uh, you know, those things you don't get to choose when those thoughts, when that darkness, you know, comes back, um, you don't get to pick that. So with all those challenges that I just described to you, you know, that, that just slipped in there. Um, and like I said, had a hard time, but the goodness in that was, this was the first time, um, I believe ever that I had the time to let those thoughts play out without interruption for me to get a deeper understanding of, you know, those tough situations that, that I had no control over those things. Sometimes in a deployed environment, things happen. Um, you know, we go to war for a reason and some bad things are expected to happen. 
And for, for those of us that witness those, we all deal with those things differently. Um, and sometimes time can change that. Um, having children can change your view on a, on a lot of things. Um, those were the things that, uh, that kind of hit me, but I had no escape. I had no, nothing to go to. I had to sit in those thoughts and let them completely play out. So as difficult as it was, um, it was a great experience because um, I thought I had gained closure through some time in therapy, um, but I, I truly didn't. But on the trail, I had the time to, and I gained a deeper understanding and appreciation for things and came out uh, on the end um, so much, so much better in my mind and my heart. It was, it was a tough experience, but it was good. Yeah. You've got, a, you definitely have a lot of time to think out there. And I think yeah. through that process, <clears throat> being alone with your own thoughts, uh, you know, I hear time and time again, how the, the trail is transformative. I mean, it really it is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I, I do want to go back to the, you know, being uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think there is something to be said for how that translates to real life. I mm -hmm. mean, in, in real life, we're, we're confronted every day with, Difficult decisions, difficult situations, uncomfortable situations. Uh, those people who do great things in life usually have to do through do so through you know persistence and grit and sticking with mm -hmm. it. And I think uh, there's something to be said about that skill being developed and learned and refined on the trail and applying that in real life. I mean, it, it you have to feel like after doing 2,650 miles border to border that if you can do that, if you can suffer what you suffered through in Northern California, that the fires and the heat and everything else, I mean, yeah, you can do just about anything. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, I would say add on top of that, you know, the simplicity that we experience, you know, on the trail, um, there was a time and, and I talk about it in one of my YouTube videos where I, I think it was 38 items that I had. I had all that I needed. I had nothing more. It didn't matter what I wanted. It didn't matter what I wish I had. I had what I had and I had to deal with it. Um, it wasn't complicated. It was simple. And I think to your point, when we, when we talk about that, uh, that grit, um, having the ability to look at things for what they are and, and take a simplistic approach and not add unnecessary complexity and not add additional layers and and all of those things. So you combine what you gain through your mental and physical toughness on the trail with a simplistic approach to things. When you get off the trail, um, that can make a big difference, a profound difference in someone's life it really can. Yeah. Life in civilization seems very complicated sometimes, Yeah, but, but I think you can cut through all that and really yeah. narrow it down to, you know, what's important, what's required, what's needed. And yeah, all of that line, just like a, mm -hmm. so yeah, fantastic. All right. Hey, anything else on the, on the PCT? What was your favorite spot on the PCT? Your favorite moment? Oh, Boiler my Rock. favorite. Yeah. Goat rocks. Um, you know, and I, um, I bring it back to, you know, one of those pictures that's in that national geographic magazine that, that my grandmother showed me. So go rocks, uh, up in Washington was just an incredible experience, uh, for me. The weather was, was bad. Um, clouds were, were going across every once in a while. I could see Mount Rainier, you know, picking or, you know, kind of poking through. Um, the sun would come out, then the clouds would move in. It was windy. I was getting blown all over the place. But that's one of those type two fun things that uh, afterwards, I, I was just absolutely lit up. It was so cool. Um, one, to, you know, go to that place um, from, you know, uh, 45 years ago that, you know, kind of sparked my interest um, in the trail itself to actually go there later and have, you know, that right as I'm in the state that I'm going to finish. It was just, it was awesome. Yeah. I wouldn't trade that for a clear day. The experience I had, I got my ass kicked up there and it was, it was awesome. Yeah. Those, those difficult times, the bad weather times, those, those are yeah. memorable. I mean, those are the ones you talk about. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. All right. Hey, let's move to Colorado. Yeah. Uh, Colorado Trail. What, uh, so you did the PCT in 2021? Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming you did the Colorado Trail in this year, 2022. This year. Yeah. Right. 
Yep. And w- which direction did you go? Uh, I went southbound and I took collegiate west. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was great. <laughs> okay. And what uh, what kind of logistics did you run into in terms of uh, permitting and and traveling there? Um, how long did it take you? Those kinds of things. Yeah, it was uh, it was easy to get there. You know, you fly into Denver. Uh, like I said, I live uh, you know right outside of uh, St. Louis on the Illinois side here. Um, I went out there three days early um, to to acclimate um, and do some some day hikes up there. So I had plenty of time to prepare uh, here. Equipment was dialed in, you know, um, I did underestimate that trail, though, i got to be honest with you. Um, but um, flew in uh, to Denver, spent a couple days in Colorado Springs doing some day hiking. Uh, went up to Leadville, which is, uh, I think, around 10-5. Did, uh, did some hiking up there, spent 36 hours just to make sure I was good to go with the elevation change. Um, then went back to Denver, caught an Uber to the trailhead from my hotel, and, and off I went southbound. And... Uh, I had sent a couple boxes or a few boxes of out course. there. Of course yeah, of course I did. Um, because the, the, I went late, you know, I started in August, so I was kind of outside of the season. Um, the, I went late because I wanted to avoid the majority of the monsoonal activity and that didn't work out. I got my ass kicked out there. I was on the trail for 27 days, uh, 27 days of hiking and uh, 15 of those days rained. And I just, uh, I was getting beat up with the rain at the beginning there. Um, so, you know, dipped in and um, did a couple of my, you know, my own resupplies. But I uh, only saw about 20 people out there um, because it was late in the season. And uh, chose to do Collegia West because I made a weather call when I got into uh, Twin Lakes, I believe is the the town, something like Um Didn't look like it was going to snow, so I took the collegiate west which has a little bit more elevation and views and uh really glad i did that um, but hardest day was up there on uh, on collegiate west and uh yeah <laughs> um but you know again uh, after that really really tough day i was rewarded with the next morning with the most incredible sunrise um so it, it made all that uh, that suck kind of disappear yeah, I think my my hypothesis is that the the best views, the best experiences come after the hardest days. And I think I think they are are inextricably linked together. I mean, that yeah. you you put in the hard work and there is this this reward at the end. That uh, like I said, I I did underestimate the Colorado Trail. That is a hard trail. And uh you know that that tough day I came uh at a Cottonwood Pass, and there's about uh, five, um, not passes that you go over, but some pretty significant climbs that day. And uh, move quickly, here comes a lightning storm. Wait out the lightning storm, move quickly, here comes another one. And uh, then the rain started, and I got on top of that last ridge, and the, the lightning started all around me, and I'm just like, screw it. I stuck my, you know, trek and pole in the air. I was like, just send it. You know, <laughs> let's, just, let's just get this over with. Um, but you know, of course I'm here, didn't get struck by lightning. Um, but I continued down and then I just couldn't find a camp for about five more miles and I was ready to stop. And then got dark, said, I just set up in the grass and it just poured all night and, uh, it let up, you know, right before, right before the sun came out and I got up and through the clouds, I mean, there's just this beautiful, pink purple colors you know bouncing off the clouds and the mountains were arranged so i could see five or six ridges i mean it was just it was perfect it was awesome so uh you know i recovered from that um that tough day before and it was awesome yeah Yeah. now me i have to tell you that if i had hiked the the pacific crest trail and done it in less than five months, I, I probably would underestimate everything for the rest of my life that, you know, I yeah. did that and uh, everything else is going to be easy from this point on. And what could compare to that? So I, I, I don't uh, fault you at all for underestimating. Yeah. CT. Yeah. It was worth every mile, but, uh, but it was, it was tough that elevation and those, uh, those climbs out there. I think it's 90,000 feet about of, uh, of, of, you know, gain and loss throughout that 486 miles. It, uh, it's, it's a run, you know, and there were some, 
some folks I ran into on the trail, like, oh, you know, because I ran into two other hike, hikers that I had hiked the PCT with out there. Um, one was doing it and then one lived in, in Leadville. And, you know, just talking to folks as, as day, day hikers or, you know, wherever you pass or the f- very few that I saw, they're like, oh, you did the PCT? And they're like, oh, man, this is easy. I was like, no, this is not easy. This is a very difficult trail. Yeah. And the people that finish that thing have, have a lot to be proud of. Wow. 90,000 feet. That's, uh, that's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's 89 or 90,000 feet. Yeah. That distance? Wow. Yeah. 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 Hey, what's next for Jay? What's your next adventure going to be? Uh, well, my current adventure is I'm writing a book about, uh, about my experiences on the PCT and a little bit of, uh, of the CT and just, you know, reflection on the experiences out there, reflection on life, um, you know, as a, as an airman, um, as a husband, as a father, as you know, those, those life experiences that built you. Um, so about halfway done with that, looking forward to, uh, uh, to finishing that, but that's my current journey. I've been really focused on that. Um, you a, hiking. You have a working oh, go ahead. Title? You have a working title for the book. Uh, yeah, my journey of reflection. Um, you know, and that will will you know adjust that because that's that's a lot of words. But um, um, in in my typical fashion, as I write something, I think you know the final title will just you know will just come to me. But um, yeah, that's that's the working title. All right, and and expected publishing date. When, when can I? Uh, hopefully. Hopefully early next year. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm trying to get it done, um, December, January, and then, you know, it'll be kind of up to the editor and, and the publishing piece as well. But, um, yeah, hopefully, uh, early, at least early to mid next year. Okay. So, I mean, you must've made a lot of progress on the book already then. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a matter of, you know, just filling in. It's, it's, you know, a huge running outline with, with content. And now I'm just going back and, um, you know, filling in those, those running thoughts and, uh, it's been fun. Nice. Yeah. I chose to, to do it all myself instead of, um, you know, getting a ghostwriter or anything. And, um, I, I'm, I'm appreciating this journey that, uh, it keeps me on the trail. It does. Nice. And what's your next hike? Yeah. Uh, so most likely, um, so this year is is college prep for my uh, my older son. Um, he starts over in Mizzou, which is about two and a half hours of here away from here. He starts next year, so we're gonna do a family trip uh, to Europe um, uh, this summer. Um, but I'm probably gonna squeeze in um, the Tahoe Rim Trail um, at some point in there. I'm also going to take my younger son uh, on a trip. Um, probably out to Olympic national park or, you know, maybe somewhere in the, in the Sierra. Um, my older son, he and I went and did the Northern loop trail up at Rainier, uh, when he was 12, you know, that was his first big hike and, uh, awesome father son bonding experience. And now we're past COVID we're past the other things and, and, um, retirement and, um, you know, all the other things for my wife and I, and, uh, now it's time to bring my 13 year old out for his, his hike experience. I'm going to let him drive that, figure that out. But, uh, probably after, uh, after school starts for, for my older son, I'll bounce out to, uh, to Tahoe and um, spend some time out there and slow down through at least the PCT portion of the, uh, the, the Tahoe rim trail. Um, after that, uh, I have, I have no desire to, uh, go after my triple crown. Um, I've done some, uh, I was stationed out in New Jersey, so I've done a couple hundred miles of the uh, of the AT. I enjoyed it. Um, ran into actually the the AT runs through the mountain um, ranger training phase in Dahlonega, Georgia. Um, so even though I didn't get to hike it, you know there were uh, a couple hikers that uh, they didn't know we were there, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't hiking season because this was in December, but. Um, uh, I did see some, uh, some AT hikers out there coming up. I could smell them about a, probably a quarter mile away. It smelled like laundry soap, big packs with probably a lot of food. All of us were hungry, uh, but we didn't, we didn't roll them and, uh, take their stuff, but we thought about it. Um, but, uh, maybe the Arizona trail at some point, I love, love the desert. And, uh, my wife and I, um, are probably going to do one of the Caminos, um, probably the Northern route. 
um, together. Um, she enjoys hiking, but not to the, the through hike level. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I talked to her, I was like, Hey babe, check this out. Uh, she's Puerto Rican. So she speaks Spanish. Wow. We got culture. We got hostels. We got wine. We got food. We yeah. got light packs. You got a pub at every, at every stop. That's right. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we hope to do that in the coming years as well. Fantastic. You sound like you got it all mapped out. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah. Meat grinder. You know where we are? I think we're at the, uh, what is it? The pro tip? The pro tip insight of the week. That's right. Hal. Yeah. Meat grinder has listened to the podcast. He knows all my little clues. It is time for the pro tip insight of the week where you get to share some trail wisdom with our listeners. So what do you have for us? Uh, I think avoiding comparisons. Um, as we talked, you know, throughout the podcast, you know, hiking is an evolution. You've said it, I've said it, you know, during our time together here, we learn, we grow, we evolve, we constantly change. And uh, I noticed a lot of that on both trails, actually. Hey, man, your pack is small. How many miles are you doing? What shoes are those? You know, uh, what tent, you know, how much does that thing weigh? What's your face weight? Um, you know, what's what's next for you? What have you done? Okay. You know, it kind of comes down to the hike your own hike concept. When we spend so much time comparing ourselves to others, we kind of lose our true selves, you know. And it's hard for us to be the best version of ourselves when we're trying to be someone else or someone we're not, whether that's on the trail, whether that's in life. So um, I noticed a lot, especially at the beginning part of the uh, of the PCT, just lots of comparisons. And I'll tell you what, the, the people I respected the most on those trails were the ones that came out. They went to REI two days before, bought the heaviest shit that that sales rep that has absolutely no working knowledge sometimes of, you know, being in that situation recommended to them, but they go out there and they suck it up and they grow and they change and they improve and they evolve. And then to see those people at the end is, is just awesome. Um, And that, you know, that comes back to that, uh, that comparison thing. There's a difference between helping somebody learn and grow or that person that, hops on YouTube and sees what Darwin or Dixie is, is carrying or wearing. And they go out and buy the exact same stuff and they have a really crappy experience. Well, that stuff is not for everyone. I think sometimes people fail to under understand that, that evolution piece as we grow as hikers. But yeah, so that's it with the comparison thing. I think that was a beautiful and articulate way of saying hike your own hike. I, I love the yeah. way all that. So that, that's uh, that's fantastic. All right. There you have it. That's it. This episode is just about in the books. Hope our listeners enjoyed our time with Meat Grinder. Want to thank him for joining us this week. Uh, Nips, how can our listeners keep up with you on social media? Where can they find updates on your latest adventures? Yeah. So I uh, I have a YouTube channel, um, JF Adventures, uh, where I documented uh, my entire PCT through hike and about half of my. my Colorado trail hike, I chose to come off the net and just immerse myself in the experience. Um, also JF adventures on, on Instagram, uh, where from time to time I do, do share, um, my experiences long or short, uh, when I'm outside. Okay. Remember to check out the pod on social media as well. We are on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And if you have comments or clips you want to share, you can send it to me at John at gmail.com. The Adventure Media Recommendation. Jay, I'm also looking to you to share a recommendation for a book, movie, documentary, something out there that's going to help our listeners stay connected to the trail in the off-season. We are calling this our Adventure Media Recommendation. What do you have for us? Yeah, so for uh, for movie media, um, I would say check out, if, if those interested in the PCT, you know, check out that Wizards of the PCT documentary. Um, it's on their website. You can You can easily Google it. Um, and then whatever trail you're going on, like I talked about that National Geographic article that I looked at from 1971. Uh, I know there's a, I have also have a, a book from 1975, I think, uh, about the PCT. I know those things exist for the AT and some of those things. I would encourage folks to to not just look at now, but if they have the opportunity, you know, find some publication or book from way back when that thing first started and see how it started 
learn about the people who built it, learn about the, you know, the, the challenges and the wins um, as the, as those trails have been constructed. Cause it's pretty amazing to uh, what we've done in this country with the national scenic trails. Yeah. I am. I have a profound respect for people who did those trails back before yeah. the age of, of all of us walking around with a computer in our, in our pocket. Yeah. Yeah, being able to access any information we want, any time we want. I mean, for someone, who, I mean, two thousand and three, even you doing the Wonderland Trail in two thousand and three, <laughs> you know, people doing it back in the seventies. It's just mind boggling. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad that there was no TikTok or anything in two thousand three because I know I would have been the victim of a whole bunch of dumb shit because of that huge back I had. I would have been all over. So uh, I'm pretty thankful that we didn't have it back then. I am thankful. I, I constantly, <laughs> are, I'm, I'm glad, constantly glad that uh, social media did not exist when I was a teenager. I oh, mean, yeah. how, many, how many skeletons <laughs> in my past would, would be public knowledge? Yeah, I'm with you. It's, a it's tough. It's tough right now for kids. <laughs> it um, is. They're making mistakes and everybody gets to see the mistakes. And yeah. uh, to go back to your, your point about comparison, I mean, social media... Oof. All you're doing on social media is you're comparing your life to others, what what they're portraying on social media, and that's just yeah. for you know I'm I am I'm not living the best life compared to what I'm seeing, and so I'm unhappy. Yeah. So it's tough, tough out there. It is. Yeah. What have we not asked you? All right, Jay. Before we wrap things up, just one more segment for you called "What Have I Not Asked You That You're Dying to Tell Us About." What do we miss tonight? Yeah, I think I went off on so many tangents in here that we went a whole bunch of different directions and uh, and great questions to to uh, to cover it. But, uh, yeah, I really stand by that comparison thing. You brought up a great point. Um, and, and to that, the last thing I'll add is is these hikes. It's not Instagram. It's it's not that uh, that perfect, pretty side shot with all of the, you know, brand tags off on one side, you know, stick your butt out, make your lips puff up. Um, that stuff is hard. And, you know, once people get past the Instagram view of these things, um, I think they'll realize that. And then that's when the real fun starts. Yeah. So if I go to your, your Instagram page and see you sticking your butt out and puffing your lips up, I, I know nah. that's, that's not real. That's not the, the reality. No, nah. feel free to blast me if, uh, if you do. Yeah. All right. Hey, that is a wrap from the John freaking mirror studio. Any shout outs to friends and family, Jay? Oh, yeah. To my wife and kiddos. Uh, love them. Thanks for the support. And uh, also a shout out to all of those small businesses and those communities along all of these trails that uh, that really sometimes bend over backwards uh, to take care of us and are sometimes underappreciated. Well said. All right. Thank you for tuning in. Always remember the trail is the trail. It doesn't care if you want to go downhill. It doesn't care if it's almost dark and you're looking for a campsite. It doesn't even care if your nipples are bleeding through your shirt and everybody <laughs> wants to see them. The trail is the trail. Embrace the sock. Oh.